So I guess we can start is uh, two minutes past two. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining at the first webinar of the prevention webinar series. Um, my name is Ilenia De Marino, and I am a deployable child protection in emergency specialist at Plan International, but I'm also the project manager at Plan USNO for the prevention project, which is funded by BHA. Facilitating with me today, we have uh, Chiara Ceriotti, who is the prevention focal point for the Alliance. And during the webinar, we will also have a number of amazing presenters who will introduce themselves later on. So while I give you a little bit of, in, of the introduction uh, about the webinar, uh, please do feel free uh, to use the chat to introduce yourself by writing your name, your role, and the organization you work for. Uh, next slide, please, Kira. As I mentioned, this is the first of a series of four webinars, which will happen between this month and the end of the project next year. Uh, the webinars, as well as the prevention framework, as built, are built around the program cycle. So we will have um, so the all the webinars will deep dive into the preparedness, needs assessment, and design phase. Then we will have the implementation phase webinar, followed by the monitoring and evaluation. And finally, we will have a reflection on the project and on the lesson learned and how these have been integrated in the final review of the prevention framework. So basically, the overall um, objective of the prevention webinar series is to share lesson learned for, from the piloting of the prevention framework in order to help colleagues uh, who are interested or are going to implement the framework. I won't share more information about the, the prevention initiatives or the prevention framework, as Chiara will uh, give more uh, uh, information about it in the next section of the webinar. Uh, next slide, please, Chiara. So before moving to usually the, the best part, I guess, of this kind of webinar, I'm just gonna share with you some of the objectives. So of course, as I mentioned, we're gonna share successes, challenging and lesson learned of these first uh, three phases. Then we're gonna share top tips on how to best approach these, um, these three phases. We're gonna briefly reflect on the implication of the challenges and the lesson learned on the overall prevention framework. And finally, we will share tools, guidance, and learning and develop initiative to facilitate the implementation of the prevention framework. Um, next slide, please, Kira. So this is, I promise, the very last slide from myself, and then we're gonna go into the the, the webinar. Um, but I'm sure that you know you are very familiar with online webinars and the ground rules. But this is just, let's say, a reminder. So we have activated the Zoom Q and A function. So feel free to use this function to ask questions throughout the whole webinar. We have allocated uh, 10 minutes toward the end of the webinar, um, and we will try to answer all your questions. Please also do engage with the presenters by leaving your comments in the chat, but also by participating and learning and, uh, with us through um, our quizzes and questions on Mentimeter. Um, I would say try to avoid any interruptions, so I would kindly advise you to turn off your mobile phone or to not look at your emails. Um, and just listen to our presenter. Uh, last but not least, uh, be respectful of all the colleagues that are joining us today. So I, I think I've taken my five minutes and without further ado, I will leave it to uh, Chiara, who uh, will start with a, with a quiz to test your, uh, your knowledge. And just uh, a little bit of a tip or an advice, remember that the fastest you are, the more points you will get. So, Chiara, over to you, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Lenia. 
Uh, yes, we would like to set uh, the scene of uh, this uh, conversation um, by starting with a quiz on, uh, on some prevention related questions. So you can um, answer uh, the different questions in the quiz by joining, clicking on the link uh, that Kira is sharing in, uh, that Elena is sharing in the chat, sorry. And uh, I think very soon we will start seeing the first question of uh, our quiz uh, on uh, the screen. Just give us a second to set it up. Here we are. Uh, question number one. Who is the target of primary prevention? You should be able to see three options, individual children who have experienced harm, all children in a community or population, or individual children at high risk for harmful outcomes. Let's give a few seconds to see what answers are coming up. Yeah, we see our answers are uh, coming in. You still have like 15 seconds uh, to go to throw your answer. Great. And exactly, uh, the right question, is, the right answer is answer number two. So all children in a community or population are the target of a primary prevention interventions. Uh, we move to question number uh, two. What is the first step that you would take during uh, the assessment phase of your prevention program? You have four options to choose in between from identifying risk and protective factors in a community, develop a theory of change, prioritize risk and protective factors based on impact and feasibility, or rank risk and protective factors within a community. We'll wait now for a few seconds for answers uh, to come in. As Elena said at the beginning, like the faster uh, you answer, the more points you get in the quiz. Great, as everyone is voting so we can uh, see. Yeah, I'm not sure we can see on screen the, the right answer, but the right answer was uh, um, A, identifying risk and protective factors with the community. Actually, uh, the other answers are uh, other steps that we take in prevention programs in the assessment or design phase after identifying risk and protective factors. So uh, after that, we would uh, rank them, prioritize them, and finally use them to develop our theory of change to address the root causes of harm in a population. We move to question number three. Protective factors reduce the probability of a harmful outcome and support well-being. Is this statement true or false? We wait for a few seconds to have uh, everyone to be able to participate uh, and throw answers. And yes, that is uh, true. That is uh, correct. 
Now we will uh, look at the other side of it. We talk about the protective factors. Uh, and now the next question uh, is a sentence that uh, needs to be completed. So risk factors are option A, factors that contribute to the child well-being. B, threats and vulnerabilities, increasing the probability of negative outcomes and C, vulnerabilities that can only be found at individual level. Answers are coming in once again. We look at the result, and that is uh, correct. So the right answer is uh, option B. Now we have one final question in our quiz, which is, uh, where are we piloting the primary prevention framework? A, Myanmar and the Philippines. B, Nigeria and Sudan. C, El Salvador and Peru. D, Niger and South Sudan. And we will uh, listen um, more in the course of the webinar to colleagues from these countries who will tell us about uh, their experiences and uh, their learnings about uh, piloting the prevention framework. Everyone has voted, the quiz is telling us. And the right answer is Niger and the South Sudan. I think now Kira can show us uh, like the, the winners of uh, our quiz. Let's wait to see how it Ah, Maya is the winner of our quiz. Congratulations, Maya. We do not have a physical prize for it, uh, but congratulations. You, you got uh, most of uh, the points. Very well done. Um, now, just a couple of words, if you can go back to our uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, uh, Elenia at the beginning mentioned the prevention initiative. Just to say that uh, the prevention initiative has been uh, running uh, within uh, the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action for uh, uh, the last uh, four years. Uh, with the aim of uh, promoting an increased uh, understanding and the prioritization of uh, efforts to prevent uh, harm to children in uh, humanitarian uh, settings. The initiative is uh, therefore supporting uh, the main uh, objectives uh, of the Alliance strategy, where prevention is uh, one of them. Uh, the initiative is uh, led by the Alliance, that works together a group, an advisory group, which is a diverse group uh, where we have representatives from academic institutions, uh, local and national NGOs, uh, international NGOs, uh, UN agencies, uh, and networks uh, for about uh, uh, 30 members. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Prevention Initiative developed the primary prevention framework for child protection in uh, humanitarian action, uh, which is uh, a document that provides uh, uh, guidance for humanitarian uh, workers on uh, key actions uh, and considerations uh, that uh, we can apply when uh, designing, uh, planning, uh, implementing uh, uh, prevention uh, programs uh, at a population level. The framework sets uh, uh, guiding principles and also specific actions uh, within each step of the program cycle uh, management for effective prevention uh, efforts and strategies. The framework recognizes that prevention has a multi-sectoral uh, nature. And therefore, although there might be 
actions that are a better place to be led by child protection actors, like identifying and analyzing the root causes of harm to children. But the framework is intended for use by all uh, humanitarian um, uh, actors. Uh, the framework is based on a desk review of evidence-based prevention approaches that come from child protection, but also other sectors like education, gender-based violence, and health. And as you can see in this slide, while we recognize according to the public health model that there are different levels of prevention, the framework focuses on uh, the first level of this upside down pyramid, which is primary prevention. Uh, why primary prevention? Because this is the level that has seen the least, the least investment and the developments in the sector. And so is, this is where we want to focus, meaning that focusing on primary prevention, we want to look at addressing the root causes of harm to children among the population, so to reduce the likelihood of harmful outcomes. How? By address, identifying and addressing risk factors that lead to harmful outcomes for children, but also enhancing those protective factors that prevent harm from happening. So Plan International has taken up the challenge of piloting this prevention framework in Niger and South Sudan. And at this point, I'll pass back the floor to Elenia so that we can hear from colleagues at Plan International of how they went about it yeah, through these steps. Thanks. Thanks, Chiara. Uh, Kira, next slide, please. Um, so first of all, let me thank you all for participating into the quiz. I'm uh, really happy to see that uh, you have already great knowledge uh, about the prevention initiative and the prevention framework. And uh, uh, many, many congratulations to Maya for uh, you know, being nominated, let's say, the prevention framework champion today. Um, let me also thank Chiara for uh, you know, setting the ground and for giving us some valuable information about the prevention initiative and the framework. Um, I will now give the floor uh, to our next presenter, who's going to you know, talk about a little bit the preparedness, so the first phase of the project cycle uh, and the prevention framework, of course. But she's also going to clarify a very important definition. So uh, Michelle, uh, over to you. To you, please introduce yourself and then over with the presentation. Uh, thank Great. you. And Great. Thanks, Elenia. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle, um, and I work for Plan USA as a Child Protection and Emergencies Technical Advisor, and I have been supporting the Prevention Initiative since nearly its beginning. So I'm really excited to be joining you guys today to share some of our lessons learned and um, successes from this first phase of piloting. Um, so obviously, as the prevention framework is set up to follow the program management cycle, the first step of piloting was the preparedness phase. Um, and one key question that constantly came up during the development of the prevention framework, um, as well as during trainings and the piloting process was, what's the difference between prevention and preparedness? A lot of the examples of primary prevention we received were actually examples of preparedness actions. So what we would like to start with today is to ask you, what is the difference? Um, and for you all to click on the Menti link in the chat and just share what you think the difference between prevention and preparedness is. And we'll just wait for you all to reflect a little bit and have some responses come in. All right, so I see we have um, prevention enables something not to happen. Excellent point. Prevention is the result of preparedness. Okay, um, that's that's interesting. Um, 
uh, we, we see a lot of that response in our in our training. Um, let's see if any more answers trickle in while you all think about it. Okay. Um, so here we have a response says prevention is action taken to stop harm from happening while preparedness is the measure taken to ensure prevention is attained. Um, that's uh, that's an excellent um, summation. Um, we have somebody else that says prevention is avoiding harmful outcomes to happen. Preparedness is how we concretely organize ourselves to design quality prevention programs. Um, prevention avoids something happening. Preparedness is to reduce, reduce the harm in case it actually happens. Um, prevention is broader. Preparedness is one aspect of prevention. Um, and then if you can scroll down, Kira. Okay. Um, preparedness is steps we follow, but prevention is actions we take to stop. Preparedness is being ready, readiness. Um, prevention, prevent harm before the happening. Preparedness basically for anticipatory action. These are all great responses. And also some of these responses really show kind of the nuances between what is prevention and what is preparedness. So um, some of the responses here are right on the nose. Um, and some of them also show like how, why it's so important to make the distinction between a primary prevention approach and preparedness. Um, so thank you so much for participating. I see we have some more um, responses coming in as well as responses in the chat. Um, so this is great. If we can go back to the slideshow now, I think we have an idea of like the range of, of interpretations. Um, but when we're talking about preparedness and we're talking about prevention, they're two very distinct um areas so when we're talking about prevention so i'm just going to wait for the slideshow to come up just give it a second i think what's really key to emphasize here is that um prevention is something that takes place throughout the program management cycle um preparedness and prevention are not uh the same thing um, during the preparedness phase of the program um, management cycle, measures are put in place prior to a cr crisis um, to mitigate risks that might occur. So it's all, it's about anticipating emergencies that are likely to happen and establishing components of the response in advance. It means that we are ready and prepared uh, should an earthquake happen or should a uh, conflict break out. It's about making sure that we are ready to respond. Whereas primary prevention seeks to prevent that harm from happening in the first place. It's not about being prepared for it. It's about preventing it from happening. So primary prevention addresses the root causes of child protection risks among the population or a subset of it to reduce the likelihood of abuse, neglect, exploitation, or violence against children. So um, and so the distinction here again, and, and, and some of you pointed this out really well in your mentee responses, is that preparedness is about being ready to respond, whereas prevention is an approach that seeks to prevent harm before to prevent harmful outcomes before they can occur. And so when we talk about prevention, it's not just a step in the program management cycle, it is something to be mainstreamed throughout. And what the um and what the uh, pr uh, primary prevention framework actually does is outline some key considerations for how you can integrate primary prevention into your preparedness phase. Um, next slide, please. So again, keeping in mind that the primary prevention framework looks at how, what key considerations we must take to, in, to ensure a primary preventive approach in each step of the program management cycle. So we are looking at how we can ensure a primary prevention approach in the preparedness phase as we are readying for a crisis so that we are ensuring a primary prevention uh, lens. And so first of all, what we need to do is understand and document risk and protective factors uh, related to the types of harm that children experience so what are those factors that will either um, mitigate the risk of a harmful outcome? What are those protective factors that strengthen the protective environment around the, ch around the child? And what are those risk factors that could lead to that harmful outcome? So we know how to mitigate those risk factors and strengthen those protective factors. 
Um, we need to include actions in the preparedness phase to address risk and protective factors and multi-sectoral preparedness plans. So when we're putting together a preparedness plan, we need to think about what are the risk and protective factors that we know are likely to happen or that we know are present um, in this location. And how do we make sure that we're planning to address those in advance? Um, so that is incorporated into our preparedness plans. We also, at this point, before a crisis happens, we need to be in, we need to be advocating for investment in primary prevention actions pre-crisis. Um, preparedness is not prevention; it means that we are ready to respond to a crisis. But it is during this time that we can lay the groundwork for a very strong primary prevention approach, and where we should really be taking the most actions to prevent harm before it can occur. Um, and that leads to the fourth point, that if we take early action to prevent harm at the beginning of a crisis or before a crisis starts, you know, that's really where we want to be because that will mean that there is less likelihood of harmful outcomes occurring if a crisis happens. Um, but again, this is where it comes into that distinction between preparedness, being ready for it, and prevention, which is when we're actively trying to reduce the likelihood of harmful outcomes at all steps of the, of the cycle. Um, but it's especially important to start working on this before a crisis occurs. Um, so with that, I would like to hand it over to my colleague from Plan Niger, Isaka, to share a bit about how we addressed and how we handled the preparedness step um, in Niger for the piloting of the prevention framework. Over to you, Isaka. Uh, good, good morning, every, everybody. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone, wherever you are. My name is uh, Isaka Burema, and I'm working uh, for Plan International Niger as an humanitarian uh, manager. So let's first quickly explain the context uh, in Niger. The unstable situation, uh, security situation in Niger has a negative impact on the population from uh, livelihood to basic services. Therefore, population displacement arises. Therefore, population displacement arises when protection risks are increasing, especially for children and adolescents, girls, for many of whom are suffering from severe malnutrition. In addition to that, Niger is a flood prone territory. The main challenge uh, we face when considering preparedness measures are how to inform and input in place mechanism for com the community to mitigate child protection risk before the crisis arises. How to establish early warning system. Slides. With the positive point that uh, we can share with, peop uh, with, uh, with uh, people here, that uh, Plan International have been working to support the community for many years and the staff is aware of the protection risk and how to prevent or mitigate them. In addition to that, Plan International work with the government who gave the mandate to set up or strengthening village child protection communities. During the prevention project kickoff here in Niger, we have had a long discussion with the team and we realized that there are more steps we can take to ensure we are better prepared to prevent the protection risks that might arise during an emergency. Thus, we, can we will focus on the following in terms of uh, preparedness. First, regularly work with community, uh, national NGOs or international NGOs in high-risk high area to ensure that the village child protection community and other response mechanisms are in place for information on protection and inform families on how to avoid unaccompanied and separate children. Regularly undertake action to mitigate the risk of uh, GVB, community action to mitigate the risk of child adoption and uh, recruitment. We can also focus on how to work with child uh, protection in village lead and village leaders and other local communities to set up and train alternative structures and other services in the event of the closure of basic services. Alternative education, alternative health structure, 
what are the alternatives for situation of uh, family separation and uh, loss of uh, parents. Also, how to ensure that basic uh, psychosocial support for strengthening resilience before the crisis. We'll also focus on how we are going to work with Village Child Protection Committee and leaders uh, to, to identify potential sites for alternative activities in the event of uh, crisis, such as uh, child-friendly spaces, school, including trend community focal points. These are what I can share with uh, uh, you here. So back to Elenia. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Akira, if you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, again, once again, let me thanks Michelle for clarifying a very important concept that can honestly can cause confusion. And also great, thanks so much Isaka for sharing um, what the team in Niger is planning um, to uh, you know, address a little bit preparedness. And that must be said, as you mentioned in the, in the, in the call, that came after the kickoff meeting that we had uh, back in May. As mentioned both by Michelle and Isaka, the prevention framework really highlights the importance of investing and advocating for preparedness. Um, and in the framework, I'm gonna share the, um, the link in the chat just now, so you can have a look at the framework while we'll uh, have the presentation you will find an example on how to do that. So at the beginning of the webinar, I did mention that the framework follows the uh, project cycle steps. So we just now, uh, with Michelle and Isaka, we've seen uh, the first phase, which is preparedness. For the next 15 minutes, I'm really, really happy uh, that we will have Hawa and Marion from Team South Sudan giving us an overview of the second phase, which is the needs assessment and situation analysis. And they will also um, tell us about the main challenges and the lesson learned they have experienced. So Hawa and Marion, please do introduce yourself uh, for the audience and back to you and uh, good luck. Marianne, you are unmuted. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, thank you very much, Elinia. My name is Marion Mwebi, and I work with Plan South Sudan as a child protection in emergency specialist. Over to you, Hawa. Thank you so much, uh, Marion. Thank you, Elinia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all. Uh, my name is Hawa. Uh, Howard Tijani, I'm a deployable child protection and emergency specialist from the Global Hub. Thank you so much. Over to you, Maya. Okay, thank you. So as we have had, we want to share our experience uh, from South Sudan. And in the next few minutes, we'll be able to highlight. And we are also joined today with our colleague, Anthony Onen, who is our M&E specialist. So later on, he can be able to come in. So as my previous pre presenters have already highlighted, we did follow the uh, project cycle, program cycle uh, phase. And uh, in, on the initial part of phase of the preparedness, there are some few things that uh, we did, which I'm going to highlight. So for those who don't know uh, South Sudan, kindly move to the next slide. So South Sudan, we are in a protracted emergency crisis. And as you can see from the map, uh, the location where we are piloting is in central equatorial. So in South Sudan, we have 10 states and we have indicated where Plan International is implementing. So this particular uh, pilot is being implemented in uh, Central Equatorial in a location called EA. Uh, move to the next uh, slide, please. So as we have highlighted, there are some few things that we did. So first, when we got this opportunity to pilot, we were very excited, at the same time a bit anxious. But what helped us is uh, 
good planning and joint planning with the Plan International USNO, uh, US uh, uh, Planning International together with the Alliance, they really helped us to understand the framework, but also be able to understand what is the primary prevention approach. Just like any organization who is planning to start it off, we didn't have much understanding. We knew there is prevention and response. So this initial orientation really helped us to understand the primary prevention approach. And uh, they jointly helped us to develop a preparedness uh, plan with the three core phases. So it's really, it was really a very exciting opportunity when we shared with our management, they were really in full support of this. Apart, of, uh, apart from that, on the initial phase also, we did have a lot of um, consultation with uh, our stakeholders, especially with the child protection area of responsibility. So it was really very exciting. Um, the last part I wanted to highlight is uh, we did take a bit of more time on this particular phase. And uh, as we have had today, we are going now to concentrate more on the st second step, which is the needs assessment. So in overall, uh, as you can see on the screen, these are the, this is a summary of what we have gone through like in South Sudan. So first we started with uh, orientation and training uh, for our uh, technical staff based at Juba. And then we also did another training at Ye with our field teams and a couple of meetings with stakeholders, including the child protection of area of, of responsibility, we, because we are in humanitarian, we also coordinate very closely with the UN, for example, UN OCHA, and we also have other national organizations who are working with us. And then the other part is the actual assessment where we implemented uh, this, uh, this needs assessment using a couple of methodologies, which my colleague Hawa is going to highlight. Then we underwent through a process of analysis, detailed analysis of this data and key findings that came from the field. And then we also had an interpretation workshop, uh, both at the field internally, but also externally with other stakeholders whom we, have in, we had involved. And then lastly, we had a process of developing a log frame budget and M&E. But as we have highlighted for today, we have to concentrate more on the next, uh, on the second part. Please move to the next slide. So on the needs assessment, uh, it goes hand in hand with situational analysis. And this is the second stage of the program cycle. And this step as uh, Kiara and Michelle have already highlighted, it's a very, very important step where we have to gather information where we have to do a lot of analysis and we have to make a good sense of the information that we have collected from the field using different tools. Now I want to give opportunity to my colleague Hawa to now take us through the actual process and some of the tools that we have used. As you have seen in the framework, there are a couple of tools that we are pre-testing. So over to you Hawa to take us through this step. As we move to the next slide, please. Thank you so much, uh, Marion. And uh, as Marion mentioned, which is the primary prevention in South Sudan, it's went so like and different uh, steps, and uh, even all the steps which is follows a program cycle steps. So here I will just uh, I will take you through the steps uh, that we followed. Uh, during the need assessment as well as the situation analysis. So the first step that we started after the preparedness, which is the desk review. The desk review is one through like and uh, different steps. And even the main objective uh, for the desk review, which is was to indicate which area that we will be focused during the primary prevention. And even uh, for the desk review, which is, was based on the evidence-based prevention approaches within the child protection that South Sudan has. And even the desk review, which is, it was like a multi-sectorial desk review. So even the desk re review, which is included uh, different sectors. So for instance, education, gender-based violence, as well as the livelihood. 
which is to indicate which area that we will be focused in, uh, in the primary prevention. Even as Marion uh, mentioned, so for the desk review also, which is engage the child protection AOR very much in order just uh, even to analyze the, the framework, the general framework that South Sudan has for the child protection. As well, for the desk, desk review, there was like an interagency review for the child protection uh, AOR mapping, very safe, which is based on that mapping we being selected yay. So yay county, which is selected based on the different process that we followed during the desk review. And then after the desk review, and even after we highlighted which area that we will be focused, uh, we will be focused in uh, after the desk review, and even the desk review, which is indicated the two harmful practices that we will be followed during the primary prevention, which is the child marriage and child labor. So after that, we went to the kickoff of activities and even uh, which is these steps, we can just say this is the assessment uh, steps and even the situation analysis. So for the assessment, we went through like and two phases for the assessment. There was like a phase at the uh, Duba level and even the other phase, which is at uh, EA County. So for Duba, we did like, uh, we revised and even we contextualized the tools that has been developed by the, uh, by the Child Protection Alliance in order just to indicate how we can use that in South Sudan. And even the m and &E also revised all the tools and even uh, all the tools that we, we use during the assessment, during the analysis, and even during the data, data collection process. So after that, we had like kind of different meetings, uh, even meetings uh, with the management, as Marion mentioned before, as well meeting with the child protection AOR in order just uh, to discuss with them, which is uh, the, harm, the harmful uh, outcome that uh, we select. In the beginning, South Sudan was selected like one uh, harmful outcome, but after the depth review and even after the discussion with the child protection AOR and even with the other actors, we indicated that no, we also we have to add the child marriage. In the beginning, the focus was for the child labor and then we added the child marriage. So, and even uh, as, as part of the assessment, also we did like an uh, interpretation workshop at Juba level. And if, as I mentioned that, so we just contextualize the tools and all the materials that will be used. So after that, we went to EA. So at EA level, which is the actual practical part is started. So we had like kind of several meetings uh, with the government as well with the other child protection uh, actors at EA level. And even, so the field assessment also, which is, will lead us for the project design. So the project design, which is will be focused on the two harmful outcomes, and even will be focused in the risk factors and the protective factors for the child labor as well for the child marriage. So the data collection process, the objective for the data protection process and even the steps that we followed, which is we conducted focus group discussion. The focus group discussion, which is we targeted the entire community members. So we included children, we included uh, and even the foster families, the stakeholders, and even we including the members of the community-based structures. And even after that, so we did like an kind of ranking for the risk factors and the protective factors and to identify which, uh, which uh, activities that we will be reach after we're going through the all M and E process. So after that, we uh, we analyze the the risk factors and the protective factors until we reach like the the final the final stage. So after that, and even during this process, we come through like kind of different trainings programs and even the trainings which is was for the data collector and even the training. I I can say also it's like an orientation process went through uh, went went. Um, through this process in order to indicate the government and the stakeholders, what do we mean by the primary prevention, why the primary prevention uh, is like kind of very good and even how we will be uh, using the primary prevention approach here in, in South Sudan. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So uh, during the data collection, so we went through like an, uh, two methods 
So we had like a focus group discussion and even we had like an informative interview. The focus group discussion, as I mentioned, it was for the community member because the primary prevention approach, which is like a community-based approach. So we have to make sure that all the community members are engaged, all the community members are participating, and they shared their thoughts, and even they, they shared, uh, they, they shared uh, their views about the two harmful outcomes. And even, after, uh, even within this process, we had like a community mobilization process, and even we, we, we took like the, the context, uh, the, the consent, the consent from the parents and even the consent from the community member in order to participate in the focus group discussion. So for the focus group discussion, we had like a 14 focus group discussion. So even we divide them to the two groups and even uh, we had like kind of two community, which is community called Makeri and community called Kamboni. So both of them, they shared their views and, uh, and even the, uh, about the risk factors and the protective factors for the child labor and the child marriage. So, and even if uh, you can see here, so the number of people that we reach. So for instance, for the child marriage, we managed to reach like and 29 people, which is participated in the focus group discussion and even participated in the uh, key, inform uh, key informative uh, interviews. For the child labor, we managed uh, yeah, to get like the, 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 the overview of uh, 51 person, which is including children, parents, community members. For the children, so we target children from 10 to 14 and even from uh, 15 to 17. So uh, children in this age, so they shared their thought about the risk factors and the protective factors about the child labor as well, child marriage. So after that, we went to uh, the ranking process. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for the ranking process, which is uh, during the focus group discussion, so the team, they managed to share their like the, the top six uh, of the risk factors and the protective factors for the child labor and child marriage, and even they make like the ranking. So they rank all the risk factors that they shared. By the way, there was like a very long list for the risk factors and the protective factors that they shared by the community member. So, and even the ranking process, Marion, she will just uh, share with us how the ranking process, it was like and challenging for us in order from the long uh, list uh, to indicate like the top six risk factors and the protective factors. So after we get like the top six uh, risk factors and the protective factors in the support of the m and &E team, so we went for the data analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So for the data analysis uh, process, so we use the tools uh, that developed by the Child Protection uh, Alliance and even we conduct like and contextualization for the tools. And after that, so the M&E team, they manage, uh, they manage to analyze all the data that we get from, from the team as we are just uh, showing here. So uh, after we get like the top, uh, the top six risk factors and the protective factors, so we infer that in the, in the tools, and the good thing that tool it's work like and automatically. So after and even when we just put the top six, also we put the ranking because the community they share with us the ranking. So after that, we managed to indicate which risk, risk factors and the protective factor that we will be used during the piloting for the primary prevention in South Sudan in terms of the, uh, the risk factors of the child labor as well, the protective factors of the child labor as well, the child marriage. So next slide, please. So after the data, after the data collection process, so that we manage also just to insert all the information that we get uh, regard to the six factors, and then we put it uh, in the in the tools in order just to define which area that we will be focused when we are developing the theory of change. So we develop the theory of change based on the top six risk factors and the protective factors that has been shared by the community member. And even I just want to emphasize to say that when we are doing like the primary prevention, so we should make sure that the community, they, they are being engaged from the first uh, step until the, the last steps. So after that, 
Uh, so we conducted also the other interpretation workshop. So this workshop, which is engaged the stakeholders as well the data collectors, and even they just uh, we went through like the uh, which is we did like a deep analysis for the impact and the visibility. The impact and the visibility we did that based on the top six risk factors and the protective factors. And even when we are doing the impact and uh, the visibility analysis, which is the the team that indicated which the main driver the driver for the uh, risk factors for the or the common driver for the risk factors uh, for the child labor and child marriage and even the common driver for the protective factors for the child labor and the child marriage so based on the on the analysis and even we managed to get the the feedback based on the visibility and the impact in the community which is in EA community is specifically in the two area that we uh, we we focus in which is Kamboni and Makeri. So after that, we also had like an uh, interpretation workshop at Juba level in order just to review and even just to agree this is the area that we will be focused in and even uh, to develop the theory of change in the in collaboration and even in coordination with all child protection actors. And even we managed to have like a meeting with a child protection AOR, we shared with them uh, which is the risk factors and the protective factors based on the visibility and the impact that we get from the community member. Uh, next slide, please. So here, as I, uh, as I mentioned, which is this is the map that we use uh, based on the visibility and the impact to indicate which area that we will be focused when we're developing our theory of change. And I will stop here and then I will hand over to Marion and even you can just go for the next slide, please. Marion, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hawa, for taking us through this detailed process. So colleagues, as you have seen, it's not really difficult. These are some of the scientific tools that are recommended and highlighted in the primary prevention uh, uh, framework which we have used like step by step. And for us, we are proud to say that it was a kind of a bit easy because we received that orientation. So now as we summarize from South Sudan, we did experience some few challenges. Uh, the first challenge was uh, uh, shifting the mindset, our thinking, because we spend a lot of time, not only from our level, but also when we went to the community together with uh, our staff and colleagues, we had to keep on asking ourselves, what we have proposed, is it in the primary prevention? Is it in secondary? Is it in the tertiary? So each time we had to ask ourselves that question. So shifting our uh, mind and uh, trying to use the primary prevention part of the brain was not easy, but uh, with the regular coaching and seeking support, we were able to get it right. So I must say it was not easy, even at community level, as they were sharing the primary, uh, the protection fa fa factors and uh, the risk factors, we had to spend slightly more time helping them to understand that uh, this is the one that falls now under primary prevention is at the different levels. So the second challenge uh, that uh, we faced, which was also not easy, is understanding that primary prevention is beyond the awareness. Uh, if you ask anyone uh, about prevention activities, they'll mention uh, awareness. So we had to understand that this primary prevention approach is beyond awareness. It's uh, not a social, it's more than social behavior change campaigns. And it's about looking at the deep root causes of harmful outcomes and trying to address those risk factors while utilizing the protective factors to be able to address those uh, pro uh, risk factors. So it was not easy. We faced some challenge there, but I must say the support we have received so far from the Alliance, from um, Plan US, it's really very good, uh, which uh, enabled us to overcome that challenge. The last one is a prioritization of the, uh, the, the risk and protection uh, protective factors. Hawa has highlighted that community gave us a long list Actually, some of them were over 15, over 20. So we spend more time 
to also uh, uh, kind, kind of put the themes together. For example, sometimes they could say orphans, OVC, separated children. So we had to cluster all these themes together. And also we had to work with them to prioritize. So when we told them among all this that you have shared, let's prioritize the top five or top six, it was not easy because all these issues are issues that are affecting communities. So we faced a challenge there. And then we move to the uh, next slide, which is the last from our end. Now, our top tips. The first one is uh, internal. It's important to have internal and external advocacy for even our management, our clusters, other stakeholders to understand that investing in primary prevention is really helpful. In the long run, we can be able to you know, protect children using this approach. So for us, we have done it internally and we have seen that good support. And when we brought also our child protection area of responsibility on board, I must say that they have prioritized primary prevention approach in all our interventions and it's part of the calendar. You know, when it's put as a CPOR calendar, that means we have prioritized it. The second and last is it's always important to work with communities, stakeholders, and manage community expectation. Once we finish the ranking, we agreed on our top five risk and protective factors. They were now expecting a very big program. So it's important to highlight and share with them what will be possible now and what might not be possible. But those things that are not possible, we don't leave them there. We also work with other sectors, for example, education, food security, WASH, to be able to integrate because one of the approaches, this is not standalone. We work with other sectors so that we can see which area can they be able to address using the protective factors and also utilizing the uh, risk factors and utilizing the, prote uh, the protective factors. Thank you very much, Elinia. That is our experience from South Sudan. We hand over to you. Thank you, Howard Marion, and please, everybody, let's give a round of applause to uh, Marion and Hawa for this amazing presentation and for walking us through this journey. You know, I, I joined as a project manager, you know, at the end of phase three, and it's really unbelievable the work that has, you know, preceded this, uh, this phase three and all the effort and the work you put into it, uh, despite all the challenges, which are of course the challenges that you share here, but also, you know, other kind of challenges. So very well done, uh, Team South Sudan. Uh, now, before we uh, move to the next presentation, I just want um, to do a little bit of a check-in with you. So please do use the Zoom reaction. Let's uh, use a heart if you're enjoying the, the, the webinar. Um, and let's use a surprise face if you're not enjoying it and you are bored. I hope I won't see much of these uh, surprise faces. I can see a lot of hearts. So this is really good. Um, now, as you, uh, and thank you for sharing the heart and the flower in the chat. Um, so now we will uh, go through the um, the next phase um, of the of of the the webinar. We're running a little bit late, so please bear with us. Um, as I said again, uh, the the framework follows the 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 program cycle steps. So we are at phase three, which is the design phase, and uh, we will listen to uh, our amazing colleague Paula, who was in Niger. Uh, and she will uh, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, the design phase in Niger and the challenges and also the lesson learned. So Paola, please introduce yourself for the audience and over to you. Thank you so much, Elenia, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody. So my name is Paola and I'm a deployable child protection in emergency specialist with uh, uh, Plan International. And uh, exactly as Elenia say, now I will um, be more than happy to guide you through the third phase of uh, the primary prevention framework that is uh, uh, design and planning. So this is a really um, critical step uh, to effective primary prevention interventions. 
and now we will see together how. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So just before to, to start to introduce you to the design phase, I just want to share that I will share our experience in Niger and in particularly really um, the region where we work, as you can see on the map, is the yellow area that is called uh, the region of Tifa. So um, if we go to the next slide, please. So let's have a look together through the design and planning steps. So as you can see, we have three main steps that we need to follow. The first one is to develop a contextualized theory of change. The second one is regarding about design population level approach to address the risk and the protective factor at multiple levels of the social ecology. And the third step is about design and plan intervention with communities and include children and their families. So to design an effective primary prevention program, we need to follow these three steps. But we also need to keep in mind the objective of the primary prevention framework, that is to work on the root causes of harmful outcome in the society. In the case of Niger, uh, the harmful outcomes identified during uh, the need assessment were child marriage and physical and emotional maltreatment. So once we collected the result of the need assessment, we had to understand how we could translate the risk and the protective factor in actions that would um, generate enough evidence in eight months program. So if we go in the next slide, please. Thank you so much. So as you can see, this is the protective and risk factor prioritization tools that my colleague how already explained to us. So what you can see here um, is the results of our need assessment in Niger. And you can see in green, we are um, uh, ex uh, underlying the risk and the protective factor associated with child marriage. And in blue, there are the risk and the protective factor associated with the physical and emotional maltreatment. Where we need to focus is the factor that score high on both impact and feasibility appear in the upper right-hand side of the diagram, the one I circle, I circle in red, and most probably a little bit small for you to see. So just like to give you some example, you can see in this red circle, we have uh, education or lack of education for children. Um, we have effective protective services. We also have income generating activities and parents with low education that are identified as risk and protective factor. So um, starting from this is where we start to design um, our activities. However, we face a big challenge right from the start. And we were not sure how to measure the impact of these activities on the evolution of the harmful outcome in the short period of time. So if we go in the next slide, thank you. So here you can see a graphic with the main challenges that we face. So the first one was, uh, that we need to consider that some harmful outcomes are part of a deeply rooted and long-standing tradition. So for example, the main question that we ask ourselves was, how can plan in less than eight months uh, reduce a practice that is, the, that is well established in the society? by implementing activities addressing lack uh, of education or through income generating activities. So just to give you like a more concrete example, um, we realized that when managing short time projects like this one, it is better to focus on improving and strengthening existing services rather than creating new ones. It's good practice to first conduct a mapping or an analysis of the existing services in the area and identify the existing gaps. In the case of Niger, we realized that one of the root causes of child marriage 
was the lack of effective social protection services. Therefore, uh, we decided to, um, to work on strengthening one of those services, and in our case was uh, uh, the birth registration. So these services, in fact, already are already in place in the area, but they are not well known in the community. So through the project, we will carry out birth registration campaigns and also support and encourage parents to register uh, the birth of their children. For example, by paying the transportation costs to access the services. The second challenge that we face, as you can see still in our graphic, is in the green box. And it's speaking about prevention is hard to measure. So considering that prevention is the absence of something occurring, it can be rather difficult to measure it. For example, how to measure and prove that the back to school enrollment campaign has been successful to prevent child marriages before they can occur. So something that we realize is that we tend to use the standard indicator already existing. For example, increased primary enrollment for children from key target group in a specific area. But instead, we should think outside of the box in the case of the primary prevention framework. And we need, for example, to measure the reduction in the risk and the increase in the protective factors. And then the last challenge, and let's say also lesson learned that I want to share with you, you can find it in the last box in um, dark blue. So is uh, regarding identify a target population. So as you know really well, as per definition of the primary prevention, we need to address the root causes among the population to reduce the likelihood of harmful outcome targeting all children in a community or in a population. So working on this project, however, I have learned that dealing with the subpopulation can still be a primary prevention approach. When we say we need to work at the population level, we might think that everyone in the area needs to be a beneficiary. However, this is not the case. According to the primary prevention framework, in fact, we need to select a subpopulation by identifying specific characteristics. And this characteristic can be the legal status, the age group, the gender, or the disability. And that helps us to prioritize the subpopulation more vulnerable to child marriage. Always to give you like a, a more concrete example, we learned that the girls aged nine to 10 are the most at risk to get engaged in the specific community where we work in Niger. Therefore, a subpopulation can be all female children aged nine to 10 in a specific community or in a refugee camp. As such, when we designed the project aiming to prevent the child marriage in DIFA through ensuring access to education, we did not plan to target all children, but only the subpopulation mentioned before that was at the higher risk of the child uh, marriage. And this is still a primary prevention framework uh, project. So if we can go to my next slide. So this is the top tips. So also from, uh, from Niger, we are pleased to, to share with you a few tips. So the first one is about report on actual risk. And now I will explain you why. I would recommend that participants report on the actual risk and the protective factor rather than what could potentially or theoretically be a risk or protective factor. So to explain you better, when we received the result of the need assessment, education was frequently mentioned as a risk factor by the people interviewed who were referring to the actual lack of education. At the same time, it was indicated as a protective factor by those individuals who were referring to the potential improvement as a access to education. 
So when we were designing the activities, we were kind of confused. At first, we couldn't figure out whether we need to write a project supporting education, as some people identified education as an existing protective factor. Sorry, and, sorry, the absence of education as one of the root causes of the harmful outcome. Or if we had to consider education as an existing protective factor and therefore not work on it. So for this reason, we suggest highlighting the difference between actual and potential in order to design the program to be effective on the real needs and the real gaps. And one last uh, tip that we would love to share is about designing multi-sectoral primary prevention programs. So the difference between a tertiary prevention program or also known as a response program and the primary prevention program is that within a response project, standalone child protection activity could be efficient, even if they are not ideal, but they can still have an effect. On the other hand, in the primary prevention project, standalone child protection activities are not enough because in order to prevent a specific child protection threat, we need to work at different level and support all the community or the subpopulation that we identify together with other sector. To give you like an example, if we think uh, about uh, um, the situation that the children uh, that is victim of a physical and emotional abuse by their parents that suffer of psychological distress because they probably have moved or uh, they went through a um, forced migration because of a war or because they have to escape for uh, any humanitarian crisis. So of course you can provide universal access to psychological uh, support or parenting support that absolutely something that is really useful for them, but this is, will not be enough uh, to guarantee that the parents in the giving community have all the tools to prevent further harm. So you need also to provide, for example, um, shelter accommodation, you can provide livelihood you know, or any like basic needs such as uh, food. So Multi-sectoral approach are really, really, really important and essential when we are dealing with the primary prevention framework program. So then just like to pass to my next slide, that is uh, uh, a picture of our colleagues uh, that are in the training we did in Niamen. And uh, it was exactly the moment where we were working and defining our theory of change. We were working on designing the activity. So I just want to really thank them because I think the success of this project is also thank you, thanks to the big work they did and also in collaboration with ministries, ministries and other uh, stakeholders in, uh, in the area that help us to design uh, a really efficient uh, primary prevention, prevention framework project. So thank you so much. And of course, if you have any question, do not hesitate to, to reach out in, uh, in the QA question. Um, section and uh, over to you, Elenia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paola. This was another great presentation with a lot of uh, insight and uh, a lot of uh, reflection and challenges. Uh, and now it's really difficult, you know, again, I also joined this, uh, this project not that long ago and I went through the framework and, uh, you know, uh, reflecting about around subpopulation and population and it's really important to understand the um the really the meaning of working at population level um so thanks once again paula and thanks to to the team in niger as well i can see lots of hearts for you um so very well done uh, we're now um at the q a um section we are running a little bit late so I might also um, only have time to ask one question for the question for the team in South Sudan and one question for for the team in Niger. Um, we would like so we have a first question that is about um, you know how for the first phase of the assessment and uh, and situation analysis 
um, they're asking how to link the needs assessment with the child protection rapid assessment. And also they would like to know what tools were used for data analyzing, interpretation and presenting the results to the stakeholder. So maybe how and Marion, you can take the first part of the question and then uh, uh, Anthony, who is the m &E person um, at, in South Sudan, the m &E colleague can take the last part of the question. Over to you. Thank you so okay. much, um, Elinia. Marian, I will start and then uh, I will give you. Uh, thank you so much for the question. So uh, it's like kind of a very good question. Uh, for us, uh, we didn't use like the rabbit uh, assessment tool. We just focus on the on the tools that had been developed by the Child Protection Alliance. But for me, I can say this is like a very good idea. And even the tools, which is indicated uh, the, 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 the root causes of the child labor and child marriage, uh, which is based on the risk factors and the protective factors. So when we can just align these tools uh, with, the child, uh, with the rapid assessment tools, which is will give us like kind of full picture about the all child protection risk that the community are facing. So uh, this is from my side and Marion, it's over to you, you can add. Yeah, thank you very much, Hawa. So when we went through this process, I remember one colleague from UN OCHA did ask us how we can use these tools as part of routine data collection. So for South Sudan, we still implement the cluster approach. Uh, so we feel the, for example, the humanitarian needs overview when uh, it's the that information is being collected, we can be able to use this, but also the rad, rapid assessment, especially the risk and protective factors, they are very good tools. And uh, so far it has been recommended. For example, when you look at case management, we have all those wide of, of range of protection risks. How can we take each and every risk and use this tool? to be able to get the deep root causes of these issues, look at the protective factors and be able to design interventions out of that, not only on prevention, but also on response. So that recommendation came strongly and we can be able to explore through the child protection area of responsibility, how we can be able to integrate. So it's very possible. And even internally, we saw it's very useful. So we are going to look at, for example, neglect, we are going to look at uh, these other risks, psychosocial distress, mental health issues, and be able to work with the communities on the same. So it's a very good process. Let me stop there in the interest of time and hand over to uh, my colleague, Anthony, to take us through some of the analysis tools that we use. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, just to, to, to go through the tools, at first we, 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 we asked all the groups to, to rank the top five risks and protective factors in each and every group. And uh, after we got those in, from each and every group, we then uh, had, uh, we then had a, 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 a meeting with the, with the with the various stakeholders who are involved in in this process and um, in the groups we also help them to categorize some of these uh, risk factors into broad themes for example some would say we need school fees we need clothes so i would say yeah those are basic needs so we help them to come up with such broad categories and uh, after they came up with the broad categories of the, the risk factors and the protective factors, um, we, we then asked them to, to do a prioritization in terms of the impact of, of these risk factors and protective factors, and also the feasibility for these risk factors and protective factors as well. After these very groups, uh, identifying the scores for, for those risk factors. We then converged together and then we, 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 we managed to plot them on, on, we managed to plot them and got the average for each and every group 
regarding the various risk factors and uh, the protective factors in terms of the impact and the feasibility. We then use the we then use the, the prioritization mapping, the protective and risk factors map, which we use to plot them against the X and the Y value. And uh, after plotting them, the risks which were in the top corner on the right, those were the most uh, those were the most probable risks that uh, the project had to zero on because they had the highest the highest ratings across all the groups. So we picked those risk factors and protective factors, and those are the issues that uh, we discussed. They were not only one or two; there were several, but uh, we had to do a deep a deep dive to to come up with the interventions that uh, we needed. For example, we noted that uh, some of the issues in the the risk factors were arising due to maybe a lack in the others children were getting married maybe because they lacked basic needs and things like that so those are the tools we used uh, for us to come up uh, with the with 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 the, with, the, with our program interventions thank you and over There you are. That's what happened all the time. We go talking on mute. Uh, thank you so much, Hawa, Marion, and also Anthony for this great explanation. We always need the ME &E specialist to come in uh, for such questions. I'm very aware of the time. We only have seven minutes and we still have a few slides to uh, go through. So unfortunately, I need to cut short this part, which I would have loved to have more time. But all the questions that you have uh, um, in the you have put in the Q and A, uh, we will try to to um, reply um, in writing. So apologies for that, but that's what always happen. Um, I will be very very quick. What I wanted to do with these slides is to give you a little bit of an update on where we are at the moment. Um, so um, we. Um, we are working uh, for both Team South Sudan and Team Niger, although at slightly different you know, level, um, to, to work on developing the baseline uh, tools. Uh, this has been a, a result of a strong collaboration between the m and &E at country level, the m and &E at USNO, and also the child protection um, colleagues, both at country level and at global level. Uh, in November, we will be organizing monitoring, virtual monitoring visits, uh, and these visits have the objective to assess how the activities are going and whether we need some adaptation. Then, as we mentioned at the at the you know beginning of the um, of the webinar, we will have of, of course the project. We will go through an evaluation, which will be also based on the learnings from the baseline assessment and the monitor the virtual monitoring visits. And again, we're gonna have um, we're gonna collect the challenges and lesson learned uh, from each phase, and we're gonna have a process of review of the um, uh, prevention framework. Um, also, we, as part of the project, we are going to develop and test uh, guidance and tools uh, to generate evidence on the impact of uh, the prevention um, of the prevention approach. So this is very quickly, uh, as quickly as I could, an, an update on um, on the M and &E and on the project. I'll uh, pass it over to Chiara uh, because you've been asking in the chat about the tools. So we're finally going to share the links to the tools, and Chiara is going to give a little bit of an overview. So Chiara, over to you. Yes, so thanks, Elena. So where to find uh, all the tools and the guidance that the colleagues from South Sudan and Niger um, have shared in their presentations? Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would say uh, go to the um, uh, prevention web page on the Alliance website. This is where uh, all the prevention focus material is uh, collected. So in this page, you can find some um, uh, key resources uh, as, uh, for instance, uh, like the primary prevention uh, framework. Uh, the guidance uh, specific for on how to identify 
and around uh, risk and protective factors. Uh, just to say, in the prevention framework, you will also find um, in the annexes, some of the tools that were mentioned in the presentations today, like on uh, how to analyze and prioritize uh, risk and uh, protective factors. Uh, then you can also find some uh, uh, thematic guidance specific to some uh, areas of work, like uh, you'll find uh, a guidance note uh, on uh, how to prevent family separation. And then there are uh, toolkits on uh, children associated with armed forces and groups that has uh, a prevention component in it, as well as the interagency toolkit on preventing and responding to child labor as a strong prevention component. And finally, a mini guide on how to prevent harm to children during infection disease outbreaks. And next slide, please. I also wanted to mention some other tools that could be of use. Uh, first of all, there is a series of short videos that you can use for raising awareness during trainings and uh, that speak about uh, like what is a prevention, why to invest in prevention, and uh, there is also a video that shows uh, like the story of uh, a, a child and how it would like by taking a preventative approaches to, to harm. And uh, uh, we had trainings earlier this year and last year. Now on the website of the Alliance, you can find the learning packages that were developed for these trainings. You'll find one which is an introduction to primary prevention for a one-day training, then a more in-depth learning package for a three-day training, and, uh, which is the one that colleagues from, uh, from Plan have been using in their pilot. So uh, that guides uh, people on how to use the prevention framework through the different steps of the program cycle management. And uh, you will also find a specific module on preventing uh, uh, family separation. Uh, there is uh, one additional module that is uh, coming up, which will, will be uh, e-learning on how to prevent uh, harm to children during infectious disease uh, uh, outbreaks. We have had uh, also some uh, uh, experience of uh, doing virtual clinics, meaning providing uh, tailored technical support to people who are planning to, to use the prevention framework in their programs or organize prevention uh, uh, trainings. Uh, some sessions were done on a one-to-one -one basis, others in small groups, gathering practitioners that are going uh, through similar steps of uh, the process of the program or facing similar challenges and the issues. Um, so for uh, if uh, you need like more information in terms of uh, uh, prevention, please reach out to the email address that um, Kira just kindly added in uh, uh, the chat. And then I think it's back to Elenia for the closing. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Chiara. We posted all the links, all the resources that Chiara shared with us in the chat. So please have a look at, the, uh, at all of them and uh, especially at the prevention webpage. And as Chiara said, please feel free to reach out to the prevention at alliance tpha.org. Uh, um, we uh, now are going to ask you to stay for, I know we're a little bit over time, but just for two minutes. Uh, because we would like your feedback. So as I mentioned, um, we this is the first webinar of a series of four webinars. So we would like to improve. We would like to make a, a, a better webinar next time. So we have a feedback form that um, Kira is going to share. I'm not sure how that you are. Um, um, so please, it's really an easy form. Uh, we just need some... Uh, some really quick uh, feedback so that the next web webinar will be maybe more interactive or there, may there will be uh, something uh, more. Um, thank you so much. I can see um, there is a question in the chat. We will receive this material by email. 
Uh, yes, uh, I believe so. We can uh, retrieve all the um, colleagues that registered and we're going to send an email with the recording, with the with all the available links, with the presentation, um, and hopefully uh, we will also later in uh, in the, this month we're gonna also share when we're gonna have the the next webinar. Um, so I'm not sure um, if you can see how many um, colleagues have voted uh, for the feedback form, but I'm very aware we are uh, we're one minute late, so not that bad. Um, no, but then maybe we can uh, go to the next slide. And uh, I really would love to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, over uh, 80 participants that uh, were here with us and that listened to our amazing presenters. Thank you so much for the presenters to, you know, work on that. Uh, there's been a lot of effort, a lot of coordination. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to, as well, the Alliance for, uh, you know, uh, letting, to, for uh, providing this platform. Um, so I'll uh, leave you to, with this slide, with the thank you slide. Um, and uh, I'll see you in the next webinar in, a, I guess, a couple of months' time. Um, so just share with me a round of applause to the presenters and to uh, the audience. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.